Mr. Bass is doing something somewhere else. I, he could be next door to Hank. He could live and be living next door to Hank right now, for all I know. Yeah. Uh, but today we have a special uh, Mr. Bass Get Your Fish On show with the champ, the champ, champ, the yeah. back-to-back champion, Hank Cherry. Uh, and we're really happy to to have him here. I before we get started, let me just give him his due. 2013, 2013 Angler of the Year. I, rookie, rookie of the Year. Excuse yeah. me. Sorry. Angler, but just rookie. Yes. Uh, four first places, two classic wins. Sponsors include Picasso, Bass Cat. I hope I have all these right, by the way. Abu Garcia, Mercury, Garmin, Bass Mafia, Berkeley, Power Pole, Trilene Fusion, TH Marine, Warrior's Journey, Pro Angler Hub, and Elite Angler. He is a stud. A stud. I hope you don't mind me saying that, brother. <laughs> he is uh, Hank Cherry. How are you, man? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. It's a little, little rainy, a little stormy here. Um, getting ready tomorrow to uh, go do some on-the-water coverage for bass. The opens here at Lake Norman. I'm not fishing, but I have a lot of friends fishing. So uh, looking forward to that. And hopefully one of them wins it. <clears throat> nice. I'm going to let the first question go to Mr. Bass, as normally I don't let that happen. Since I have been told I talk too much. <laughs> Hank, man, it's a real honor to have you. Uh, you know, I am blown away with uh, your success uh, to, to win classics back to back. Only four anglers have ever done it in the history of the classic. And uh, just an, an amazing accomplishment. But you almost won the classic in 2013 also, didn't you? Yeah, I came real close, really, really about five feet away, probably. Yeah, I think five, some of our guys five feet away from number three. Some of our guys watching don't realize that you had the winning fish on, basically. Uh, it just didn't make it into the boat. No, it's just one of those things that just uh, that day did definitely did not go my way. It was actually a miracle day, the way things started happening. And uh, there were not just that fish, there were other key losses throughout that day. But to be able to keep fighting through at that point with that kind of stress and pressure and never being there before, uh, just to have that opportunity was a good thing. I mean, looking back, sure, I would like to have it know that I had three now. But I think that kind of lit a fire and just progressed over the years. And then, uh, you know, when it was my time, it was my time and it was my time twice. So maybe it'll be my time three times, four times. Who knows? Wouldn't that be awesome? Oh, yeah. I think about it, and, and when I try not to think about it, people like my wife and my friends, they all remind me, you could be the first one to win it three times in a row. So you could. Nobody, you could. Nobody's, nobody's putting any pressure on me, but it's 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 that thought still there in the back of my head every day. So Ken Duke, you know Ken Duke. Ken Duke and I say getting to the Classic is the, one of the hardest things to do. But when you get there, because the field isn't gigantic, it could be one of the easier tournaments to win is there any truth to that or all is ken just crazy no i mean once you cut the comp once you cut the field size down you free fish up people don't understand what i mean by that but you're taking you're opening up some places that there would be boats occupying normally but it's just a different it's a different venue it's a different feel it's different than the way we fish any other tournament throughout the year because there's no points we're all fishing for first place and so you kind of just got to take a really good educated guess because the way the practice schedule is, it's so, it's so spread out that it's very, very hard to dial in on a specific pattern. And very rarely does it hold up the whole way, but you pick your best pitch and you go throw it for, for those first two days. And hopefully after the first, second day, you find yourself in the top 50% of the field with a chance to win on the third day. Yeah. So Hank, I wanted to ask you, uh, we had uh, Jacob Wheeler on a few weeks ago, and, you know, he's on this crazy tear where he's won. He won three tournaments this year, plus Angler of the Year. And we asked him before going into the final tournament, uh, are you nervous? Do you feel any pressure? Uh, and uh, he said, I don't feel any pressure at all. He said, I feel super relaxed and calm. And he says, I felt that way a lot this year. And uh, I thought, man, I got to ask Hank this question when we get him on. Uh, how do you deal with pressure? Because to me, uh, I would think going into your second classic, 
was there more pressure or did you feel, did, were you off the hook? Did you, did, did you not feel pressure at all? Or, and, and how do you handle pressure? Because, uh, this tournament fishing thing is such a huge mental game. You know, I mean, the mental part of it to me, uh, and, and I'm, you know, I'm nothing compared to you. I, I just do small little terms and stuff, but the head games, you know, the stuff that gets in your mind, uh, that has nothing to do with your ability to catch fish is really something, uh, to deal with. You know, the, the pressure in the second one was nothing, uh, like the first one. It's just, it's hard to explain until you're in that situation, but I, mm -hmm. I knew after the first one that going into the second one, especially having two really good days to begin with, that I had been there before. I knew what was in store the next day. I knew the crowds. Uh, I knew I was just going to have to deal in, deal and control what, what was in my control and let every, block everything else out. Um, and I knew that some of the other guys that were in contention hadn't really had that experience. So I knew I had that leg up, but I really didn't have any pressure pressure because I said it before. You know, win and one was my dream. It never went past one and one. And then then to have the opportunity to win two, you know, I, I even asked my wife after the first one, I was like, what was it, about a month, I guess? I'm sitting around. She's like, what's wrong with you? I was like, I don't know what I do now. I mean, I've caught the spirit. I've caught this thing I've been chasing my whole life, and what do you do? And then through us talking and working out, you know, you go win another one. And then uh, so now, now I've got two. Um, to win a third one would be a huge step in, I don't know, that's uncharted territory because nobody's ever won three in a row. Um, but just to know that I can go in there and look at those trophies and see that, you know, I'm one of like one of 36 guys, I think, that's ever won the thing. And to have yeah. won it twice, uh, that in itself is a fulfilled life. And I've said it before again, and I'll say it again right here. If I don't ever catch another bass, I've got those two trophies to prove that I was good enough to do it on those six days. So just out of curiosity, where, where does, because I have two questions. Where, where, first off, where are, where are the trophies right now? Are they like in a separate room or do you just like, like if, to be honest, I put them someplace where every time someone walked in, they saw it and they, and, you, you, <laughs> and I could just go, yeah, that's right. That's me. <laughs> well, see, we're in the process of all this memorabilia that we've collected and some pictures my wife has got me in a framed jersey and some baits and magazine covers to go in one section of the house but we've had some hiccups along the way of getting that involved so right now you could say i probably have the two coolest end tables you could ever have because one's got one on one end of the furniture you go to the other side of the room and it's on the other end so they're kind of my uh, bookends in the living room so sorry to, to interrupt here. So on the on the first the first two years ago when you win the classic, you had two good days. You're going into the third day. Uh, did you start to did you have the flotilla of boats that did that have any effect on your fishing? And uh, did you find the fish? I mean, did you pattern them for the third day? Did you like save fish for that third day? If that makes any sense. Um, I wasn't really saving anything. I just knew where there was a bunch of fish that had been overlooked. I didn't really know how many were there until the midway through that second day. Um, the third day just started off slower, but I knew in my head the wind was supposed to pick up. We had a full moon. I needed to get out of the sky. So there were a lot of things bouncing around in my head about leave and come back, leave and come back. But I kept telling myself just to stay calm, stay there. They're going to bite. And then throughout the day, it picked up, picked up. And then by lunch. I had caught enough fish to win the tournament. At lunch, did you just say, did you, when you caught that fifth one, brought that, that one, did you, did you just say, I've got this. This is, I, my dream is coming true. And did that have any effect on the rest of the day or did you, were you overly excited or what went through your mind as that whole process happened? No, I, I kept convincing myself as I would call up throughout that day. And even when I caught that last big one, that I needed to catch one more, that I needed one more. I mean, I had myself convinced the whole day that I would be trailing that I needed one more, which dealing with the numbers and the weight, somebody would have had to have a better day than I had the first day to come back and beat me. So, you know, it was just 
I, I wasn't trying to be satisfied. I didn't want to stop. It was the last day, and I wanted to make sure I gave it everything I had just in case I didn't win. So normally when I start these, and everyone's asking where Mr. Bass went, he has bad connections, and if he comes back, it's all right. If not, it, it's you and I. Oh, here he goes. Uh, there he is again. Uh, tell me how you uh, got introduced into the outdoors. How did How did you get your craving and love for fishing and hunting and everything else? Um, well, my dad and my great grandmother introduced me at a very early age, catching trout, just going to the pond or down to Lake Wiley here in South Carolina and fishing for bluegill, just something where I could get a bite. Um, the bass fishing thing just came naturally, I guess, from my dad. He kind of created a monster. Um, you know, it was, it, it really took over my life from a young age and it's all I wanted to do. It's all I wanted to do. It got so bad to a point where everybody was telling me when I told them, I was going to be a professional bass fisherman someday. They were telling me, you can't do that. It's a pipe dream, whatever, this, that, and the other, the whole story. Um, but it's been there from the beginning. And the hunting thing kind of happened in high school with one of my good friends, Bill Abbey. He introduced me to deer hunting. And it just, that was another thing that I took just a huge liking to. And it's been something that I've got to share with my family. My wife enjoys it. My son enjoys it. So all that stuff. What it, what it did in the long run, I guess, and, and God's way of letting me know is it kept me out of a lot of trouble. Yeah. It really did. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Mr. Bass? Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, Hank, is it seems like uh, the jerk bait has been your friend for quite a while. And uh, I, I I was surprised when you won on Gunnersville to see you throw on a jerk bait, uh, and probably just because of my lack of experience. But uh, I've fished Gunnersville multiple times. Not once have I ever even taken a jerk bait to Gunnersville. <laughs> and uh, there were the other thing that impressed or surprised me was uh, it wasn't a huge secret that you were doing that, but nobody else was really throwing a jerk bait, were they? Not really. Um, when you go to Gunnersville, you think of the grass and everybody tries to yeah. pattern them really in the grass. And the first day I got really blessed and lucky and I caught some really big ones in the grass. I just knew what the way the weather was and it not going to warm up. There were no more coming. What I call up there was what was up there. So, and I just knew from the riprap and the history of the causeways at Gunnersville and the lack of attention that Browns Creek Causeway was getting and the history of it having so many big fish around it, it just made sense to capitalize it there. You know, the classic this year, everybody talks about the jerk bait. Well, you wouldn't expect that in Texas, the time of year, it's hot, it's a hundred degrees outside, the lake's flooded, every bush is underwater in the lake. But they had such a cold year and the lake froze over that six, eight foot down around that dam, the water temperature had stayed calm, stayed really cold. So it allowed fish to stay out there a little longer. Now they were leaving as the tournament was going on, but they stayed long enough for me to capitalize on. So as far as jerkbait fishing goes, I know when the water gets cold, I break out my jerk baits and I know all about that. What what do you look for? And on late on bodies of water and in times of year when it's not typical jerk bait weather, what do you look for that tells you this is this would be good a good time, a good place, a good area to throw a jerk bait? Um, you know, if I see like on flats, I see a lot of shad activity, that's the first thing that's gonna key me into it because they're kind of high in the water column. If I see smaller fish schooling on top, I'll throw the jerk bait to get below the school. Um, but it's really just one of those things you have to just kind of play with. I mean, now mm -hmm. I can say that I've caught them in water as cold as, you know, 30 degrees and I've caught them in water as warm as 89 degrees and everywhere in the water column. It's not something that's going to work all the time, but I really think when fish are in that, say six to 15 foot range and they're feeding on shad, that it's definitely something you can throw and have the opportunity to catch a fish or two that you wouldn't have caught doing something else. Our boy Booster asks, which lake would you like to defend on, Gunnersville or Ray Roberts? Gunnersville, 100%. What makes Gunnersville so much, in your opinion, better than Ray Roberts? 
I don't think it's better. It's just that my history at Gunnersville is very, very good. I understand the lake. Um, and God's full of big ones. I mean, I like Ray Roberts. It's, and and Gunnersville is only six hours from the house. So it's a, it's a much it's a much easier drive. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think Gunnersville just Gunnersville really just sets up 365 days a year, sets up better for the way I like to fish than Ray Roberts. That, but, now, but now saying that I've never seen Ray Roberts at normal level. So I don't even know what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Rath. Sorry. Um, I got one more jerkbait question for you. I, I just uh, am curious. What is, I, I know you're a Berkeley guy and you're an Abu guy. What, what's your setup for, I mean, what's your jerk bait of choice and what's your, your rod, your reel, your line? What, what do you break out when you, when you're fishing a jerk bait? Well, well, now we've, we've just released the Stunna. It's the bait I was throwing at the Classic this year. Um, it's one that I put a lot of input in that we got designed and got out in a hurry. It's a really good bait. So I like to throw it. Um, typically, I throw my jerk bait on 12 to 15 pound fluorocarbon. I use 100, 100% fluorocarbon trialing. Uh, that's a little heavy for most people. I just am very confident that I don't think the line really changed the action of the bait. And... With that bigger line, I think I can drive the hooks into them a little deeper. I can fight them a little harder because I've, I've just got this thing in my head. The longer they stay in the water and they're not in the boat, the better chance they got of getting away. <laughs> um, and then I kind of battle that. I, I, this year, I spent a lot of time um, throwing a 610 winch rod that was made for a jerk bait, uh, mm -hmm. specifically made for that technique. And I switched on and off of my reels from the STX 7.3 to 1 to the Zeta 7 1 to 1. Both those are excellent reels. The gear ratio, because of the spool size, isn't that much different. Um, but I prefer the higher speed reel when I'm throwing dirt bait just so I can take up line faster. Uh, the rod action is like a medium moderate. So it's got a little more bend to it. So th there again, it kind of counterbalances that heavier line for fighting the fish. And I, I just feel like with, with that maximum bend in the rod um, that I can torque them a little harder. And get them to the boat. Whereas if it's a fast tip, I got to worry about them kicking and throwing the bait. We've talked to everybody we've had on lately about this forward-facing sonar and how it has changed the game. What are your thoughts on has it has it hurt the fishing? Has it helped the fishing? What what are your thoughts on what's going on with all this new technology we've run into the last few years? Oh, I love my Garmin. Uh, my live scope is just basically my eyeballs under the water. I haven't used now what Ben Garmin three years. I haven't used 2D traditional sonar now in three years. I mean, I might have it on occasionally, but I don't believe it. Like that forward facing sonar, uh, what it tells you, it's like watching TV. What it shows you is there. Now, you can't always catch what's there which ends up hurting people, but I think it, it definitely shows you what's there. My, I always wonder is how far are the electronic companies going to take it before the, the fishing industry says, okay, this is enough because it's really, really, I mean, it's, if it says there's a tree there, there's a tree there. If it says there's a rock there, it's a rock. If there's five fish there, you see five fish. Um, but all that said, you still got to learn to use it just like anything else. And you can spend a lot of time using it and not be able to get those fish to bite and waste your day away. So um, I think it's good. I just don't know what the end game is going to be. But I, I enjoy mine. Yeah, I, I think everyone enjoys it. My, que my question, though, is has it gone so far that, I mean, they're really expensive and rightfully oh, so. But has has it gone so far that it takes out some of the not the fun of catching fish because it probably helps catching help makes it fun because you're actually going to catch fish. But does it does it take away some of the, the that old strategic plan that anglers used to use? You know, when we first met ten years ago or whatever. I don't think it does. I just think it's the the game has just the game has changed and everything's evolving with the game. I mean, because. Back then, they used to use the maximum horsepower in your motor was a 150. Now we're running 250s. Yeah. Um, size of the motor, the horsepower. The horsepower, I never thought that I would think about 
a trolling motor in terms of horsepower, but some of the trolling motors today could just jerk your boat around. You can go five miles an hour, six miles an hour with a trolling motor. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know where it'll stop, but I think the younger generation is enamored with all this new stuff coming out and tech technology. And those are the guys that are doing all the studying and learning and they're coming out of college and coming to fish to opens and coming to fish with us with this learning curve that's, that's really been cut short because they have this vast knowledge in the internet. So, you know, it's a job and if it makes me better at my job, that's what I'm going to use. And I, like I said, I've been with Garmin now three years. It's a great company. Their product I think is absolutely the best and I've won two classics using it. So yeah. I'm definitely not going to say anything bad about it because no, I, no. I really, really like it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that makes sense. I mean, really, two classics is everybody dreams of winning the classic. Mr. Bass, sorry. Uh, with forward facing sonar, um, what do you look for? Uh, you know, if if uh, I get a brand new one and turn it on and, and get hit the lake for the first time, what what do I what am I supposed to be looking for looking at that thing? <laughs> well, you know. Hold on a second. We just got messed up. There we are. Um, the first thing I did when I got it was I took it to something that I knew. Like I said, okay, let's go look at a bridge column. And then I lined oh. it up to look at a bridge column. And then I said, okay, I know where there's brush pile. I'm going to go look at a brush pile. But once I did that, the biggest thing or the biggest issue, I think, with forward-facing sonar that people have to overcome is they have to be able to learn to throw into the cone. What I mean by that is how – the transducer shoots out ahead of you. You got to be able to land your bait in it. And every boat is a little different because mm -hmm. it's, it's a little different on the troll motor shaft. But once you do that, then you get to kind of learn, which is cool is you'll learn, well, I found this brush pile that I happened to ride across the 2D. I'm looking at it, saw it on my side image. Well, I spin around. Now I can put the troll motor down the water and I can look at that brush pile. And by the time of the year it is and what's going on, I can give you a pretty good educated guess. Well, hey, that's all crappy in there. Or there's some, there's a couple of bass. There's a big catfish. You, you can get that detail with it. And the more you start to learn about fish seasonally and how they go, uh, it really, really cuts your practice time down. Like in the grass, um, you may figure out, hey, they're an eight foot and they're in the eelgrass and you've caught a couple on a trap or a chatterbait or whatever you're throwing and you run to the next area and you put it down and you just scan around out there in eight foot and you see some dots up in the grass, but you pretty much know they're bass. I don't have to cast at those fish to know what they are. I just mark a spot and I can keep on moving. So it's a, that, that alone has allowed me to practice a lot without even having to cast, which is pretty cool too. Wow. Our, our, our boy Booster had a great, this is right in here, do the new electronics force you to scan rather than rather than fish during practice? Well, um, I'll tell you something that I do. Like if I think fish are on point, I will not scan the point. I'll pull up, put my troll motor over, and I scan it with my with my forward facing sonar. I will not drive over anything anymore. I don't do that anymore. That's just something that I've gotten used to. I can see everything that's there. It doesn't take me very long. Um, now, if I'm running over something in the, in the river channel or something, I might slow down, turn around, and look at it again. But as far as places that I think I'm going to fish, I don't run them over anymore because I think with all the electronics these days and all the pinging that you will run fish off looking at stuff and then spinning around and trying to fish it. So that, I spent a lot of time doing that. That was one of the question, One of the things I, I noticed years ago when uh, – Remember when the the Berkeley Gulps came out? So yeah. I, you, you know I redfished. So the Berkeley Gulps came out for years. For the first, we got them like really early. But for like the first two years, you could cast behind a redfish, and that redfish would smell it, turn around, and attack it. But after about two years, you would make that perfect cast either in front or wherever, and out of nowhere, that fish would start to, to turn off of it. Mm-hmm. With the ping going on and everybody ha doing it, do you think at, one, at some point in time that's going to affect the bass and that they're going to feel the pressure and move off, or is it just something they just aren't feeling at all? Um, I've definitely seen um, 
instances where like I could shoot a brush pile and cast my bait to the fish and I'm watching it go down and they kind of go off my screen. And I've done that a couple of times. And then I just, the same day I'll find them on there. And once I see them, I know my cast, I turn away from it and make that cast and I've gotten them to bite. Um, where I noticed it a lot uh, was springtime catch a crappy when they're way up under the docks and you're shooting a jig way up under there. You catch four or five or six and then all of a sudden the school breaks up. Now, traditionally, did, did they do that before when I couldn't see them? You know, I, I don't know. I just know that the group starts to spread out after you've been there a little bit. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I, I wanted to ask you uh, this question that Wilmer put put on the screen here. Uh, oh, how, does the stun, how does the stunna perform uh, compared to the Vision 110? Um, making the bait, the first thing that I said I did not want to do because I have so much respect for the guys over there at Megabass is I didn't want to build the same bait. And what I say by that was there's no need for us to build a Megabass if we can go buy, if people can go buy a Megabass, I can go get a Megabass. So I want to build something different. Um, I kind of took, with the help of Dan Spangler at Berkeley, we kind of took my thoughts on the best baits in the industry for jerk baiting and try to combine them all into one. Hmm. Um, and that was my vision. That was the way we planned it. It took several different uh, give and take, because this is all during COVID. So all this is on Zoom calls and emails and look at this bait in the tank, this, that, and the other. But we hit it, I think we hit it out the park. It's a bait that uh, not only myself, other people have been successful with the colors are good. The hooks are good. It's ready to fish right out of the pack. It's something that I'm proud of. And I think it's going to be around for a while. And I think people are going to catch fish on it. How, how long was the process to, to do all of it? Was it, I mean, I've seen uh, lure companies and lure people and it's, it's not an easy process to start a bait, try to make it better than others. And, do that but how long was the whole whole overall process how many tweaks also did you go through once you got your first your first one your first sample uh to fish? um it was pretty cool because the first baits i got i got three of them with three different bill angles three different bill styles three different weights and i lowered it down to two and said i kind of want in between this but i like this bill and this bait and the second time i got them back uh one of the three i was like this is the one and, and they even said it usually doesn't happen that way, but I took it down the dock. I caught a, it's like the second cast I made with it. Just, it was just a clear bait with a little red on the back of it. Just wanted to see the action. I caught like a three pounder. Nice. Uh, yeah. I was like, yeah, this is the one. So that's how it all started. And, uh, we got them as, we got them as over here as fast as we could get them. Um, tried to make, uh, and take our time. Cause you know, a lot of that happens and you have success with the bait and the quality control falls down and then none of the baits are the same. So we did the best. We did the best we possibly could to get them over here with the same quality, the same bait that I threw at the class. We all wanted to be the same thing. So we didn't want to have a secret. Like I'm throwing this special bait. Nobody else can buy, but here, buy this bait. That's not what we want. It's the same bait that I have. I take it right out of the package. Just like everybody else will have the opportunity. I fish it right out of the package. Nice. I like to hear that. Uh, so you you have the new bait come out. Uh, how hard is it to not share that bait with like your other your friends or your other competitors? One of the things I one of the things I think is really funny about uh, when when you know I cover you cover the classic or the 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 stuff. How secretive everybody is, even though they all know the same things pretty much. What's out there. But how, how crazy is it to, to try to keep something really secretive, like a new lure that you're, you break out and start, you'd start catching fish with and that nobody else has seen? How tough is it to keep it a secret? Um, pretty hard for me because I wanted people to see it just because, and, you know, I was, I was pretty proud of it. I'd waited, a, I'd waited a while to have it built. Uh, there were a couple of colors that I didn't want seen, um, but now they're out and – cats out of the back so i'm not really worried about that i'm just i'm just happy to be a part of something that's gonna put pleasure in other people and they're gonna get the joy doing the same thing that i've been enjoyed doing for the last 20 years and that's catching fish on a jerk bait yeah 
Okay, this is a perfect segue, Hank. Uh, Steve and I have this ongoing argument. <laughs> that, uh, we, ask every, we ask everybody we interview, does color really matter in fishing? Okay, in most instances, I will tell you, color makes the stores look pretty and catches fishermen. Whoa! Now he's yes. time. This is why we're friends. He, he hasn't got <laughs> to part B. He hasn't got to the second part. Ninety percent of the time, there are certain <laughs> seasonal things that happen where I think color is super important. Like in the wow. spring, with the reds and the chartreuses and things like that. I think that's very important. But I, yeah. but I think you could draw the line at it. Um. And I, I make this comment all the time when I'm talking to my son or when I'm talking to really anybody and they're talking about colors. I was like, those bluegill don't swim under that dock and change colors. They're pretty much green, a little blue <laughs> to them, a little brown. Um, colors that appear in nature catch fish. Now, are there things like pink worms that'll catch fish? Yeah. I mean, like the biggest mystery to me is still the floating worm comes around, you pull it out in April. You throw it in the lake and fish eat it. And they're like, well, yeah. all of a sudden the pink worms start falling from the sky. Something, I don't know why they eat it. And then it gets a little warmer and it's gone. Um, <laughs> but the theory on that, I think, is a lot of fish, when they're colder, I think it affects their eyesight. Some of them may stay deeper. So as they progress towards the warmer months and they get towards the sun, the reds and pinks and bright yellows, they stick out. So I think color most of the time catches fishermen more than it catches fish, but definitely throughout the year, there are certain times where certain colors outperform perform others. Yeah, we had one yeah. uh, fisherman. I, that, that we I'll be about. honest. Go ahead. Sorry, dude. I, I was just going to say we had one fisherman uh, that we asked, and he said, when it comes to soft plastics, he doesn't think color really matters. But when it comes to hard baits, uh, he's a little more picky about the color. Um, yes and no. I mean, like pretty much when I throw soft plastics, it's either green pumpkin, watermelon, or black and blue. So there's three. But those are all colors that are, are going to occur in nature on the bottom of something they feed on. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the jig. I don't carry 10,000 colored jigs. It's a green pumpkin. Maybe with a green pumpkin with some blue flash in it. And a black and blue that's just what i carry but once again those colors keep reoccurring in the food chain in nature all the time i'm going to ask a couple of questions from people that are online booster asked another great question i don't know if you can see this how does hank think he will approach the classic at hartwell next year or this year um yeah, i've had a lot of success there uh, i'll try to block history out and go figure out what's going on at that point in time. I'm sure I'll be looking for a herring bite. So it'll be fish out in the open water. Hopefully uh, that's going on. If not, I hope the whole lake is red and 10 feet low. And so I'll go crankbait the whole time. But other than that, I'm just going to really try to enjoy this one. Uh, enjoy what I've accomplished and perhaps win my third in a row. Yeah, that would be unbelievable. Kyle asks, Hank, if you could add one new lake to the schedule for next year, where would it be, why, and how would you fish it? Uh, Cayuga Lake up in New York because <clears throat> it is absolutely 100% some of the best fishing I've ever done. And I'd like, I'd like to go like late June, early July, so I could throw my crankbait over the top of the grass and watch them eat it on my live scope. Did – Looking at next year's schedule, what are your thoughts? I mean, it's a lot of the same places, but that one lake, uh, Iowa or something. Ohio. Yeah, Ohio. I, 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 I kind of hesitant about going back there. Last time I was there, I separated my shoulder riding in the waves because the water was so rough. Really? Yeah, <laughs> so um, I'll get some revenge there. But I think this year's schedule, uh, you're going to see a lot, a lot of big weight tournaments. They're going to happen real fast. I mean, they're all going to be piled in there. The Classic won't be huge weight, but St. John's, Harris Chain, yeah, I mean, T, and then Chickamauga all together, all four of those are going to be monstrous weights. And then Lake Fork, I mean, you're not going to, there's not going to be any 
There's no freebies this year at all. Do you like the schedule like that, or do you, would you rather have it uh, tougher fishing, you know, all pared down a little bit? You know, it is what it is. I mean, I've got to play on whatever field they put me on. I definitely would like to have a few spotted bass fisheries thrown in there from time to time, but uh, I understand it's a business and they have to go where uh, the money is, so I understand that. But um, there are definitely worse places we can go. <laughs> so I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking forward to getting back out there. Like this year, it all happened so fast and it was crammed in and done. And yeah. uh, so I, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back at it. St. John's is always one of those, if you can find the grass, it's good. Uh, but you're hitting it at the right time. And then you come from St. John's, which is going to be, when you come to Harris, it's going to be a completely different fishery because with the, uh, just how much more grass and everything we have at, at there compared mm -hmm. to the St. John's. So it'll be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm going to go to Mr. Bass. Sorry to take your time. No problem. Hey, Hank, uh, I read an article about when you were at the Classic um, and – they mentioned a decompression room, and I was like, "What the? What is a decompression room? I never heard of that before." Um, it's basically when you get done, they give you the trophy. Your wife gets your flowers. All the confettis come down. You've been around the loop in the um, arena. When you get off, uh, it's you and your family, like some close friends, a couple sponsors. They take you into this room to where there's no press, there's nobody, there's just some water, some Coke, whatever. It's just a quiet room where you can just kind of just reflect on what just happened. Um, okay. it's, a good, it's a good place. It's a good place to visit. I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, it is, but it's just, uh, it's just a place where you kind of go and, and just, you take deep breath before the roller coaster ride that's getting ready to start happens for the next 48 hours. And let me just jump in there as somebody who's covered the the classic for years. As soon as you win, every media person, and there's like 400 sometimes at the classic, instantly needs to talk to you and ask some of the dumbest questions on the face of the earth. Correct? That's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I, I I went in one like two or three years ago at the at the classic. Uh, I don't even know the guy's name. He he was a an a, an amateur. He won like a Bass Nation, and on day two, he just killed it. And every time he talked, he was like, "I got to give praise to God and this." And it was really wonderful. And then you know, here's stupid Steve raise his hand, and I just said, "So how does it feel to kick all these guys' asses for <laughs> one day?" And he. <laughs> lit up and had the best time after that but it is uh the pressure does the is there a lot of pressure do you feel a lot of pressure from the media side when you start doing really well the classic and other and other tournaments not really i think i've just over the past nine years i've just dealt with about everybody and i've dealt with positive i've dealt with negative and i, I don't i don't worry about it. they're just doing their job i'll help them the best i can you know and if if uh, it's not something that I really want to deal with or I've got a problem with, my wife has no problem taking over from that point. <laughs> uh, I love that. I love that. Uh, because that's, I mean, as uh, to be honest, you're a great ambassador as a classic champion. You're a great, there's, and I don't want to say anybody in particular, but there's been a couple duds. Not in the last 10 years that won the classic and you're just like, they don't have the media presence. They don't want to do media, but you have always been open. I've seen you on Luke. I, heard, I think I heard your wife on Luke one time, if I'm mm -hmm. correct, uh, and other places. And, and, and you promoting the sport is wonderful and you're a great ambassador, right? You should already know that. Thank okay. you. That's a, that's a big part of it. Yeah. So, you want me? uh, Hey, what is the warrior's journey? Oh man, the warrior's journey. I should let you tell. I should let you tell how all this began because you just said. Jacqueline, there. come in here. There, he, there you go. <laughs> come here. You can tell the warrior. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hey. Uh, it's good to see you, by the way. 
No, the warrior's journey is um, actually something that um, I travel from my job and I was coming back from a trip from Pacific North Northwest, flew into Atlanta and um, my team, the Carolina Tar Heels were playing the Kentucky Wildcats in basketball, which is my favorite sport. Yeah, mine too. Walked into a place to have a burger and ended up meeting them. And um, these two just incredible gentlemen, we sparked a conversation. Come to find it, they hand coins over to me and they are uh, chaplains uh, for the US Army. And um, basically their company is The Warrior's Journey and they are literally the best way that I can put it. It's almost like a, it's a one-stop shop. You, if you are a veteran, whether you're active military, a family member, um, veteran, retired military, uh, you basically can go here to find anywhere from a church all the way to extensive, like PTSD, suicidal Mar um, marriage, counseling. marriage counseling. Um, my company that I work for movement mortgage just signed on with them to assist in, in housing nothing better than a VA mortgage right now. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like a one-stop shop. Like what do you need help with? I can help you. I can find you a resource. And, um, it's in a, the Kevin Weaver and Chad Yates, those guys are, their hearts are just full for the military and, and, and our passion. One of our passions is the military. So that's what the warrior's journey is. It's a great organization. Yeah. That's awesome. awesome. Everyone, yeah, awesome. I guess it's on warriors journey.com. Warriorsjourney.org. Dot org. Everyone should go there and check it out and make sure you, they have free homes or they've had someone, Matthew said, or free homes for veterans too. So that's yeah. even better. That's awesome. There are times they do that a lot awesome. of different, different events and stuff like that. There's a lot of resources that they have for you. That's awesome. Everyone needs to go check that out for yeah. sure. Yes. For sure. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, there's a bunch of people that have stuff, but Derek wanted to say thank you. I guess you must have signed his hat. You signed an LTF hat with Thrift and Matt. Okay. Me. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was when we did the show. We signed one for him. Yeah. And uh, cool, there was cool. one other thing. I'm trying to find it, but maybe I lost it already. Oh, here you go, Hank. What is your thoughts on next year's schedule? Do you enjoy the season? Oh, we already said this. The same lakes. Would you would you prefer more uh, like a variety instead of the same places? It seems like you get, we go every year. Uh, I would prefer some change, but it's it's limited now because it's become a production and people don't quite understand this. It's still limited to where they can go get the camera service because there's other things involved now than just the going fishing aspect of it. But I think there are things in the work to be able to make us go other places here in the near future, new technology. Yeah. Yeah. What about the number of tournaments? Do you, would, would you, uh, do you think uh, you would like more tournaments on the, on the circuit or, or less or about like what, what's there? I would like more. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that I'm in the minority or majority with that, but I definitely would like more. Huh? Do you feel like when you have more tournaments and you get on like a routine that you're, you fish better? Is that why, or is it just because, uh, you know, it's a better chance of winning and making, making more money? Um, you know, I just like bass fishing is my career. So I would just, I like fishing any chance I get. And I really would just like to fish more tournaments. I mean, I, I don't see anything wrong with like one, one a month. Um, I mean, cause basically right now, it's not that I don't work when I'm not fishing, but I enjoy the fishing work a lot a lot better than the other work. <laughs> do you fish? Do you fish? Do you ever fish the opens or anything like that? Um, I did before, but I haven't in a while. It's just uh, coming through there and knowing how hard a road it is to get to where I'm at. That I just I let those guys go at it. I feel for them. I wouldn't want to have to come back to the opens the way I did. I just, I just, I just wouldn't. Now, there might be a time where I get in one here or there just to maybe dust, get the dust off the rods, especially early in the year. But typically, I've got so much other family stuff that I really don't want to miss. And this time of year, in the springtime, we're going a lot. And with baseball, like I said, now softball with my daughter, I'd like to be here as much as I can for that stuff. Yeah, yeah. 
uh, w- would you like to see the tournaments like next year? The tournaments actually kind of go later in the year for the first time in a long time. Would you like to see some September, October, November tournaments too? Oh, I wish. We know we had that well, last year when it ran. I think next year it's over in August again. Yeah. I like fall fishing. I really, really enjoy fall fishing. Um, I'd much rather fish in the fall than I would around the spawn. I hate I hate fishing for spawning fish. They're just so irritable. I think it's because you're messing with all women, and they're just hard to get along with sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> the best answer of all time. <laughs> But no, I, I like fall fishing. I do. Uh, they're on bait and they're roaming around. They're typically the weights are a little lower, but um, I, I just enjoy the challenge. But I mean, I'll go wherever the schedule takes me. Yeah. So uh, on your Facebook, uh, you posted a question just recently: uh, late summer, where to fish, shallow or offshore? And uh, my thought was, well, what would Hank Cherry? What would you prefer? Uh, shallow or offshore and why? Um, it's probably half and half for me. I like the top water bite this time of year, especially late in the summer. You can get some pretty good explosive bites, but where I live, predominantly spotted bass roam, and you can really catch some good ones out there in that 25, 30 foot of water on a drop shot and things like that. So I'm kind of a half and half guy. Did, did when you were growing up, did you have – did you fish that whole spectrum? You know, you will go from a jerk bait. Now you're fishing drop shots and stuff. What is there one part of your uh, repertoire of fishing that you've had to work on over the years so that you can become more of a well-rounded angler? Um, you know, the jerk bait was something that that I just developed on on my own. I guess my dad, when he was teaching me, uh, I learned like most other people with a plastic worm. Um, and ironically, I probably haven't thrown a Texas rig plastic worm in I don't know when. It's been a long time. But um, I think everything I've done, all the techniques that I use now, have just kind of evolved. Um, there was a while in the tournament trail where we fished a ton of TVA lakes and a lot of cranking and offshore fishing was done. So you didn't hear a lot about the power fishing up close and up on the bank and this, that, and the other. So, um I think I've just been one of those guys that I've tried. I've always tried my career to do something different than everybody else was doing and maybe not fish as fishy of places as everybody else. Cause in my mind, if I'm fishing somewhere that's not as good as there's 20 boats fishing, but the fish in my area are only seeing my bait, I have a better chance of doing this. Technique. The, the little BS technique Mr. Cherry hates to throw. I don't know. A shaky head is probably the one thing I hate to throw. Is it just the, the slowness of it or? I, 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 I fish so fast most of the time I can't get it to the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and I tell people this all the time. We, we go smallmouth fishing and I'm like Ned Rig stupid because I can't catch a smallmouth on a Ned Rig. <laughs> Right here. I, I, I don't think I can let it get to the bottom long enough. <laughs> I, for some reason, have a real uh, – well, I'm in Florida, so I don't do much Ned Rig, and I take a lot of grief about it. I don't I don't think people realize that we live in a, a fishbowl down here, a, a bathtub, mm-hmm. and we don't get real deep waters. But at the same time, I can throw a, a worm, an 8-inch worm, or a, a wacky ringed worm like, like no other. And mm-hmm. – it's it's just what I do. Sorry, Mr. Bash, your turn. Okay, uh, Hank, uh, I love Picasso lures, and me too. Uh, shock blade. Yeah, I love that shock blade. I noticed me you're too. sponsored by them. What what's your favorite Picasso lure and why? Um, God, we got so many. I mean, I'm pretty fond of my jig, the Doc Rocket. It's pretty cool. It's got titanium weed guard, so it doesn't have a typical brush weed guard like traditional jigs. But I've I've won so much money off that bait. It skips really well. It comes through trees good. It comes through bushes good. I mean, so if I had to pick one, it would be that. I mean, the Shockblade Pro is probably the second. And then there's there's a Shockblade coming that's not quite in the market yet. Or it might have already hit. I don't know. It's close, but it's got a uh, – it's got like the com- 
pewter board chip lip on it instead of a metal bit. It's got the oh, same yeah. as the bait. It's got a totally different vibration. I used it last year at St. John. I caught a couple of big ones on it. Um, so hmm. that probably those those three baits probably the best. I think. I don't think that new one's come out yet. As it's close, I promise. Yeah. It's close. It's got. I forgot what they call it. Something like a board or. It's got some kind of name, but it's just like the same kind of stuff they build, like homemade square bills and stuff. I have wooded plugs, have that computer board lip. Yeah. It's, it's going to have a computer board blade. It's pretty good. Yeah. I, I love chattery fishing. I love chattery fishing. And that shock blade is, I think, an underrated lure. I, I don't think people, I think everyone, I, I love the jackhammer too. I'll be honest. I love the jackhammer, but I'll, I'll be brutally honest. That shock blade is an exceptional lure. It is an exceptional lure that has a, the vibration it puts out and how fast it starts. And you don't, you can, it's, you know, you can put a trailer on it, but it does work really well without a trailer where mm -hmm. no offense to the jackhammer without a trailer on the jackhammer, that thing's like, like everywhere. You never know where it's going. Yeah. Uh, but that shock blade bro is, that is a fantastic, fantastic lure. I'm going to give it back to Mr. Bass there. Uh, Hank, Chris asks, uh, wants to ask you uh, about your involvement with the original chatterbait. <laughs> um, God, it goes back. It was just a uh, Byron General Store. I can't remember how many years ago. Uh, Ron was in the store. First time I'd ever met him. He said, I have a bait I want you boys to try. We were just kids. So we tried this thing. The first time I tied it on, I was like, this is stupid. It's like <laughs> harder than a spinner bait. It's just, I don't know about it. And then once we figured out the power in the bait, um, there was a time where we would help deliver the baits to the stores, the local stores, but we would buy them all when they got there. So nobody could get any of them. <laughs> but the original, the original one, the one Ron made out of his house, that original bait will never be duplicated. It's head and head and shoulders better than a jackhammer. I mean, if that style bait with that blade, you know, they have their patent. They'll never, ever make one better than the original one. No chance, 100%. It was the way it hit the head, the way the blade was put in there. It didn't last as long because it would, it would waller its way out and the blade would come off. But by far, hands down, that was the best one ever made. I just wow. wrote an article for Coastal Angler about about chatterbaits, and that was one of the things I had I had read that when the first original chatterbaits would come out, all the pros or all the guys that were nearby selling them would buy them out, so no normal angler had a chance to get them because they were that good at the when they first came out. Oh, I was just a normal kid at that time, but I knew I knew how special it was, so I just cleared the rack off. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. For my own heart. That's cool. Uh, have you started to, because you've had good success at Hartwell uh, already, and ha have you start, do you start now looking at the classic for next year, or do you, like, looking at, like, like, online stuff, not, you know, the normal stuff you can do? Do you I start looking at that? I won't do any or anything for Hartwell. Um, I'll start when it cools off, probably around November. I'll start just riding down there a day at a time, just to go ride around, probably won't fish, just to re-see the lake and just graph. Um, but I try not to get I, – I try to do my best not to get too worked up or too jacked up about it. I just try to treat it like it's another event. And uh, and just enjoy it. I mean, that's the one thing that I've really come. This will be my what seventh one in nine years, and I've really come to learn. I've been at the bottom of it, the tournament, and I've almost won the tournament, and I've won the thing twice. So I just know how special it is to be there, and I just really want to make sure that I don't let the pressure of the situation take away from the enjoyment of it. How hard will it be to not go back to the tendencies that you that you've had at Hartwell at going to the same places? Do you try to hit those places up, or do you try to find some new spots at the same time? I definitely won't hit them up, but just because 
all else fails, I know where I'm going to go. So, I mean, I've been there so much that time of year. If all else fails, I know where I'm going to go. So it's in my best interest just, just to go with an open mind and uh, act like I'm just seeing it for the first time. Yeah. Cool. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you is uh, you you kind of have a reputation of being someone that uh, mentors uh young anglers or or young up and comers that are are trying to trying to make it in the sport and uh what would be your advice to a young man or woman who says the same thing that you said your whole life which i'm going to be a professional angler i'm going to be a professional angler um what's it take for a person to 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 achieve that kind of a dream you, you, if you're going to do this, like first thing I'm going to tell you is you can't be afraid to fail because I mean, it doesn't matter. Even if you make it, you're still going to fail. We're all going to fail from time to time. That's just part of the journey. That's just part of the, the tour you have and the track you have to take to get there. Um, I can tell you that I heard today, uh, something I was listening to a, uh, motivational stuff. I was waiting. I think it was my son was in the tennis chair and something that Matthew McConaughey said um, at a commencement speech he was doing. He was like, you know, you always hear these people say, you can go do this, but make sure you have something to fall back on. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, that that's really the dumbest thing I've ever heard because if I'm going to fall, I want to fall forward. You know, I want to fall forward so I can see where I'm going. You fall backwards. You don't know what's behind you. Nobody wants to move that direction. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would tell people, I and mean, I tell them now. I was like, first thing is, excuses only sound good to the people that make them up. And there is no try. There is no if. There is no when. The key word that they need to concentrate on is how. If you're in your mind, you think, I want to be a professional bass angler. How do I get there? How do I get to this point? That's putting things in motion. That's turning dreams into reality. You write those things down and then it's solid. It's concrete. You hear people all the time sit around, they talk and they say, well, if I had such and such as money or when I get here, that's just all rubbish. Anybody can say that. If you set a direction with how, then you have a course. You stay on the course. If that's what you want to do, don't let anyone tell you. You can't, you know, you're, you're going to be the one that sets the controls on your path and you're the one that has to answer to yourself. You don't have to answer to anybody else in this life until you're responsible for kids or a spouse or whatever. So mm -hmm. my best advice is whatever you choose to do, you be the best, you do, you be the best at whatever that is. If you want to fish, be the best that you can do. Your best might not be Hank Cherry's best or Kevin Van Dam's best or Gerald Swindle's best. You want to be a librarian, you want to be a garbage man, whatever you want to be. That's what I tell my kids and I tell the people I talk to. You just make sure you give it a hundred percent. Would yeah. you like to see would you like to see either of your children uh, be a professional angler? Um how good is Christian fishing? Christian Christian loves it, but I, I, I truly hope he follows his passion for baseball uh, before he takes his turn, but he really, really loves fishing. So I would not deter it. Um, I just want to make sure that he looks at all options before he chooses this road. I won't, mm -hmm. I won't steer him one way or another because I'm just not that with him. I mean, he wanted to learn to play golf, so we let him play golf. So it's, it's kind of what he chooses, but eventually i mean that'll that'll be his path i can't he can't walk my path and i can't i'm not going to walk his he's going to take every step now i'll be there with him to make sure that if he falls he doesn't fall too hard i'm going to pick him up but at the same time he's an incredible young man and i expect big things out of him that's great i love that awesome. uh dan chris flay asked please ask hank why so many great anglers come from North Carolina, the competition made you all better anglers. Is, is that right? Pretty much. Cause most of the, most of the lakes around here suck. <laughs> the <truth. laughs> I mean, you gotta go from where I live. They do. You gotta go to the Eastern part of the state to get to where the fishing's pretty good. But I mean, if you can catch fish 
on with the crowd that we grew up around and as many anglers as you had to compete against that were already professionals you know we're fishing against them growing up at 17 18 19 20. so the learning curve was out the window when we showed up we had to fish against whoever was there that day and it could have been anybody from jason quinn to hank parker to guy Aker. i mean to, to name household names and they're in the tournament um and then on top of that the fishing is not real good like norman i still remember when it took 18 i mean it would take eight pounds to win a tournament oh every weekend it seemed like wow the fishing is better than that now but that it was just the lakes we had around here if you could catch them here you could catch them anywhere and um you see these guys and we all grew up fishing against each other i mean myself brian thrift andy montgomery matt airy i mean shane lehue shane Lineberg, the list goes on and on like all those guys you see that same list every saturday at the boat ramp ready to fish the saturday morning wildcat so um that's, we all learn from beating up on each other that's the truth go ahead uh one thing i was going to ask you is uh and you kind of you kind of touched on a little bit when you were talking about color uh and the fact that there's a uh, a lot of different uh techniques out there it, you know if you're not pro fishing professionally i'm just a guy i love to fish for fun it's almost overwhelming when you walk in the tackle store there are so many freaking lures and you were talking about well that you know a, a lot of these colors are designed to catch the fishermen and i totally agree with that but how do you simplify it you know i just want to go out and have fun but i want to catch fish every time i go out you know and i know that's not reasonable sometimes that's just not going to happen but what what are the handful of techniques that really ought to just put in my back pocket and really try to master those before I start getting into swim bait fishing, uh, glide baits, uh, you know, all these other crazy things that are out there uh, that are incredibly expensive. And it seems like, man, every time you turn around, there's something new. Uh, what's that handful of techniques that uh, a, a young guy needs to, uh, a new guy needs to try to work on first? Um. You know, I'd probably just go top to bottom. I mean, it, it, three things if I had to have, I would have probably like um, a smaller to mid-sized chopper or whopper plopper, something that's loud across the water that's not a lot of effort, easy to cast, throw it a long way, just reel it back and forth to get to see it. So when they bite it, you get to see the bite. So all that's pretty cool. Um, and then I'd have to have some kind of shock blade or chatter bait with just a regular mm -hmm. curly tail grub for a trailer. Because you could use it everywhere. I mean, you catch saltwater fish, bass, bass on it, whatever. And then just an old-fashioned, um, you know, some worm weights, worm hooks, and pack of generals or pack of cinco's or pack of eight-inch ribbon tail worms. I mean, that's all you really need, I think, to cover the spectrum anywhere you go. And just learn to do those three things. And then if you eventually, once you've learned, you know, crank a chatterbait through cover or shock blade through grass, whatever it is. You can translate that over to throwing a trap or a square bill or whatever. So they all kind of relate. I mean, if you can fish a worm, you can fish a jig. I mean, I wouldn't get caught up in every single technique there was, but if you had those three, you could master those three. I mean, if you can throw a chopo, you could throw a buzz bait. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's the way I would approach it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, there was oh, one, a question up here. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Uh, if you could change, I don't know, Mr. Cherry is in charge for professional fishing for one day. What does he change or do first? Um, if I was in charge of professional fishing for one day, uh, I would have an A and a B plan. I would have one. We would all, all the professionals as of right now would be under one league. In part B, uh, I would be out would get us a sponsor that would cover entry fees um i think i think <laughs> if I could do that then that would be something accomplished do you sorry mr bass i've got to go i got to i go did, ahead my go head's ahead. now exploding do you think there's ever going to be a time where we can take the elites and major league fishing and combine them and if so do you think that now we're three years after this, that we're finally over some of the, there were a lot of hard, there were a lot of people not not happy with it. They were upset with what Major League Fishing did to each his own. 
but do you think we could ever come back and actually make it one combined thing? And or and if we couldn't, wouldn't it be really killer to make some high entry tournament? To say Toyota and Mercury is in charge of it, some that sponsored both both groups, and high dollar and take say we're going to put the ten best guys from elites against the 10 best guys from Major League Fishing and then the 10 best guys from maybe NPFL or whoever. Could that ever happen too? Oh, it could happen. Now, I don't think you're going to see the – I don't think you're ever going to see the uh, two join or come back together because um, there's some that embrace change and that don't embrace change. And here's the deal with fishing. All right, now this is going to sound harsh, but it, it's the truth. Like. You can't fish professionally the rest of your life if you're not competitive. I mean, that's just my thing. Like, when, when I'm not being competitive anymore, like I've told my buddies, my wife, hey, just hit me on the back of the head. You've, you've had a good run. It's time to go. So there's always new kids coming around. There's always going to be the new Double kids that coming. And so you have to do that. That's every sport. Like, people can't say they don't watch baseball anymore because Babe Ruth's not playing. Okay, I mean, that's just the way sports evolve. So I think you have egos and attitudes that are never going to allow that to happen. Um, as far as the two having futures, well, that's just going to really depend on ownership of MLF and ownership of Bass and continuing to go in the right direction. Um, now, is there enough room to hold the third one with NPF? NPFL, I don't know. I mean, they have some good guys over there. They have some good talent, especially running behind the scenes and on the cameras and all that. They have pretty good backing. Um, how all the anglers are going to work out in all this, I don't know. But I do think that there is an opportunity to where you could get that crowd together. You could have that big money tournament. Um but then again, putting it together, you would have to have Entity A, Entity B, and Entity C all in the same place together, and, and there's that ego thing again. And there are some there are some huge egos in the bass fishing world. I mean, like <laughs> monsters. So, um, would I like to see it? Yeah, I mean, in my eyes, I'd like to see it, and I'd like to see it like uh, the top thirty from each. Yeah. Hey, let's let's go at it. I, I would but then again, I would love have, what rule what rules do you use? What format do you fish? Do we do five? Do we do as many? Is it a pound? Is it a pound and a half? Is it two pounds? I mean, so it's like it's not like American League and National League when we have a World Series. It's it's just not that it's not that simple. We're letting the pitchers hit. Yeah. So I mean, you know, it just it just depends. But what I like to see, yeah, because I have a lot of friends that that fish the other one. Yeah. So it's 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 to each their own. Um, but I do think within the next couple of years you will see some kind of quote unquote world championship, league championship, whatever you want to call it. I think you'll see that for too long. I like this. This has cool. made me very happy. <laughs> very happy. Cause quite honestly, when the when Major League Fishing started, that year was – it was kind of really odd to go cover you guys at St. John's when you're down here in Florida, and then I'm over on Toho covering them, and, you know, you can't say, you know, when I'm with y'all, I can't say Major League Fishing. When I'm with Major League Fishing, I can't say Bassmaster. Yeah. And all – and everyone came from Bassmaster. So – why? Why can we not talk about this kind of stuff? It was it, and it, it's finally seemed like it's it's gotten a little bit better. But then there's always someone that's poking the bear, and oh, yeah. the bear needs to bear needs to take a swipe. Yeah, and uh, you know, let's hope. I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to you because I, I, Mr. Bass, I, I, I could blow up here. Okay, one thing I wanted to get your opinion on. I'm a Bass Cat guy. I know you're sponsored by Bass Cat, and I love my cougar. Uh, but uh, last few years, man, the ten boats have really been kind of taking the taking the elites by storm, and the other pro 
series, you know, uh, I know Rick Pierce, I heard him in an interview and he said that they've looked at it, uh, and, and run the numbers every which way they can. And that it just doesn't make sense for Bass Cat to, uh, work on a, a, a 10 boat. What, what, uh, what's your feelings about, uh, 10 boats versus fiberglass boats? Look, the only time I want my 10 boat and I have a sea arc is when I'm at the beach and I can just run it up on the shore or oyster shells when I'm fun or fishing or red fishing. <laughs> I don't want any part. I have buddies that run them, but I'm going to tell you right now, I don't want any part of a 10 boat, four foot waves having to run 60 miles. I don't want nothing to do with it. <laughs> don't, start, here's the, don't tell me it rides smooth. Don't tell me it rides good because I've been in them all. I'm going to tell you, there are water out there that we have to go on that they don't make boats to ride on. It's just that's facts. Yes. Like, I mean, yeah, you can drive them better than others, but there's there are just conditions where you could be in a submarine. It's not going to be a fun ride. It's just how it is. Um, but I don't want any part of a 10 boat. I do like them. I look at them a lot. I look at those express boats. I really, really like them. I think about all the stuff I could get into down at the beach and in the coast in them. But as far as for what I'm doing, I really, really just don't think. I don't know if it's safe is the word. I just don't think I can handle it. I don't know. I think that's understandable. I think that's I mean, I, I, I like that. I'm not, but don't get me wrong now. I'm not putting anybody down because that's what they like. They may, they, there's the guys that don't like a basket. They don't like that. Well, you don't have to drive mine. I don't have to drive yours. So, I mean, that's just yeah. what opinions are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I totally agree with you. You know, if you ever ride in big water, man, uh, it, I, I would feel much safer in a, in a, and a fiberglass boat for sure. It's a more comfortable ride too. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, and, and there is something to be said to feeling safe when you're going 75 miles per hour or 80 miles per hour in a boat. I mean, cool. that's the that's the God's honest truth. Yeah. So uh, everyone, I want I'm gonna we're gonna let uh, the champ go here. I we really do appreciate the time, brother. Uh, it's always great to see you, and I know a special thanks to your wife, and I hope Ella does is kicking it, killing it in softball. And what position is Christian playing, just out of curiosity? Uh, Christian plays a little bit of second base, a lot of center field, and he pitches. Nice. As a shortstop, Sweet. I like to hear the second baseman and shortstop, they got to they gotta oh, yeah. see each other. Uh, so how, how old is he now? He's 11. So, so we're in the same – Thomas is swimming, uh, and Christian is, is playing baseball, which is great. Mm -hmm. So, uh, But anyway, we just want to say thank you for the time today. Everyone, you got to make sure you go to Hank, hankcherry.com or go to at hankcherryfishing on all the social media. Uh, I'm sure I, we really do appreciate the time. It's great to always talk to you. Oh, I know. I had a question. How big was that bass you caught with the Bassmaster people the other day? Uh, are you talking about the one at Lay Lake? Yeah. I caught it with uh, the Marathon group. We called uh, – the one I took the picture of was a five-pounder. Yeah, it looked a lot bigger than that. Well, we couldn't get all three of them in the camera. Hard. We were trying to get it close, but it was just a five-pounder. I could have said eight, but it was a five-pounder. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's good to be honest. But everyone, go check out all his sponsors. Go like him and follow him on, on all the social media stuff. And he's he's a great ambassador to the sport and a great champion. And we're very happy and thankful for the time tonight. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. We'll talk three to you soon, brother. Three I hope so. Three in a row. Three in a row, three in a row and I'll be there and we'll do it live. 10-4. Yeah. <laughs> okay, dude. Right. Thank you very much. Thanks. See you guys. Later, bro. I'm going to turn him off. Right, dude. How can you top that, man? We are killing it with these things. You know that. We are killing it, man. We are so good. It's amazing. <laughs> All you gotta do is have a good, good guess, man. It's pretty easy, dude. The oh, chats. Fun. I don't. I obviously don't get as many people watching on my channel as you do. I gotta just say that right off the bat. Uh. So there were a lot of people. There were a couple questions. I think there were a couple questions for you, uh, Mr. Oh, Bass. Man. Here you go. Do you see this one, Mr. Oh no. What baits would you use if you're trying to go after those big fish over five pounds on your swim uh, bait? 
Sorry, I didn't get to that one. So just out of curiosity, can you tell us where the hell you are? How come I didn't know you were doing this? Uh, I don't know. I thought we talked about it, but uh, you know, sometimes I, sometimes I, uh, I'm clueless and don't get the info out. But uh, several of the guys on the channel know uh, they're talking about me being up in uh, Wisconsin on the Mississippi River, La Crosse, Wisconsin. I'm fishing the uh, bass, the the BASS uh, kayak tournament on Saturday, and. I I've never really been up. about 10 years ago. I fished as a co-angler up here on a BFL. So that's a one day tournament. I didn't do any practice and I don't even know where we fished. I don't know. There's three <laughs> pools up here. There's three pools up here, seven, eight, nine. I went and to one of these areas. I just rode in the boat. It was brand new. I'd never been there. I just rode in the boat and caught a few fish and had a pretty fun time. So <clears throat> I took a few extra days to come up here just so that I can hopefully try to figure out one of these pools and figure out what the fish are doing. And, uh, uh, it was a fair day today. Uh, but, uh, uh Oh, my wife's up here. He told me when he was halfway there, <laughs> I'll take it personally. <laughs> Amazingly, That's she and I are texting true. about you right now. True. I gave her more notice than that. <laughs> yeah, so I got the same problem at work. They're like, "What? You're leaving?" Uh, so, but, so how is the fishing? Did you? I mean, did you catch them? Um, I caught uh, about ten fish today. Okay. I didn't, and I didn't know if that was good or bad. And then I bumped into another kayaker that's in the tournament uh, at, right at the end of the day. And uh, I, I don't know him, but uh, he has he has a wrapped kayak. Can you believe that? And uh, yeah, I and I asked him. I said, "Do you fish in many of these tournaments?" He said, "I fish all of them." And I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, if he fishes all of them, then he knows what he's doing." And I asked him how he did today, and he said he caught ten fish today. So I'm on par with him. What you know? Uh, in but, size? Um, I had two really nice ones, and uh, I had. I probably barely had five keepers. Wow. Um, and then I and then I probably lost. The, the grass up here is just everywhere. There is grass everywhere. And uh, I, I don't know how many I lost in the grass, uh, but maybe another 10, you know. And I, I don't know that any of those that I lost were any, of any size. What were you throwing? Um, I'm throwing a lot of different things. Uh you know, chatterbait, uh, swim jig, uh, you know, all, all the typical things that you would, you would fish around, around grass. Yeah. I, had so told I, don't, you. Know, I don't know how it's going to go. I, mean, I, I got, I got two more days of practice to try to fi figure it out. Well, hope, I mean, you're, it sounds like you're not on a bad start if you've got 10 and you lost a bunch too. Yeah. Uh, what I don't know, though, is that if I can repeat what I'm doing on tournament day, I, I, I don't, you know, it's not like one of these locked in sort of patterns that are, are, are easily going to be du duplicated on tournament day. Uh, Booster, yeah. yeah, this is a kayak tournament. Yeah, he's going to he's going to kill it. This is going to be your tournament. I got a feeling. All right. Good. And, and good really, time. why don't we wrap your get your fish on Mr. Bass yeah, live good. podcast for the thing yeah. on the, I mean, that's what should be done. Ah, we need to do that. That's a good, good idea. <laughs> I was I telling you, I better bait. Okay. Booster. I'll, I'll, I'll break one out. Yeah. 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 I mean, this spinner baits, this is the time of year. I mean, falls falls here. Now the uh, frog fishing has picked up drastically down here. Uh, which is great, and uh, you mean the beautiful dove that descends the nuggets of truth. <laughs> <laughs> what is she talking about now? Oh my uh, oh. I, I was telling you, uh, so I'm, and nobody else knows this, I edit for a couple other channels, uh, and 
so I, I'm editing for a buddy and he's got a huge channel. He does something drastically different than what we do. So we had a uh, meeting at, of the minds today at his house going over all the stuff. And, and he's talking to me and I'm staring out the window and I'm going, what is that back? Now it's going in one ear and out the other, everything he's saying. I have no clue what we talked about that first 20 minutes. This is the God's honest truth. I'm like, what the hell? But it, I'm looking over there, and I'm like, is that a pond over there? And <laughs> literally, my brain stopped, and I said, hey, can we go outside and look? What, is there a pond right over there? And he's like, yeah, yeah, nobody ever fishes it, and it's this and that. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is it. Next, uh, I'm supposed to be there in two weeks. I told him I'm going to be there probably an hour and a half early because I'm going to go fish for an hour and a half, and then we'll do our meeting at 12 to 3, and come home and everything will be good. But I was out there and I saw like a, a six pounder, like right there as soon as I got down there. And I was <laughs> like, oh man, of course, this is how it's going to be. So I'm looking forward to it. Uh, so this dude's not a fisherman, huh? He's He's got access to this amazing water and he doesn't fish. So it isn't, so uh, it's a little weird here in Florida. <laughs> um, all, we have a lot of, where they build uh, houses and they have to have retention ponds in oh. those subdivisions. Oh, so okay. sometimes you can find an established uh, subdivision that's 10, 15, 20 years old, and you can find those retention ponds. And every retention pond, they're supposed to put bass and maybe a carp or two in there uh, just to so it doesn't get stinky and all that other stuff. Uh -huh. And this is just one of those retention ponds that's behind all of the houses that you can't even see. It's actually in a preserve. And I was, you know, it's one of those, it's just, it was just complete luck. But like I said, all the retention ponds down here in Florida usually have bass. It's just how big are they? Are they overfished? That kind of stuff. So this is one that you can't, you couldn't even see from the, uh, you couldn't even see from the road. It was behind a bunch of houses. So I, I got a feeling that, I'm gonna do really well uh, at this little this little retention pond. That's awesome. It's fine. It's hard to find a honey hole yeah. that you you only got access to it. Say that again. The little bee on here says that uh, he fishes in the mornings. I text my bosses. Yeah. I tell them, I tell them I'm taking a long lunch. <laughs> <laughs> well, geez, if you start in the morning. And take a long lunch. I mean, that's breakfast and lunch. <clears throat> well, just out of curiosity, when is your when is your favorite time to fish? Are you a early morning or are you a evening? Uh, I person? love fish. I love fishing early morning, but I'm not a morning person. So uh, you know, I usually get up uh, around six thirty or seven uh, most mornings, and uh, the the nice early bites already over. I probably only went, I probably only hit the lake when it was actually dark once this entire year. Really? In the morning, yeah. So I was going when I used to, uh, before uh, Topwater Johnny and I started fishing together, uh, we would, we, you know, we would fish in the mornings, but I was going to that pond in the evenings, but I, I started to feel like uh, that because the water would get too warm in the afternoon that the fish would be a little were acting a little bit different so that's when uh you know i started going in the mornings a little bit more i i, I kind of like the morning fishing better in my opinion so this is an interesting i've been thinking about it since i saw it on here i think tom said something like uh man all i do is look at the comments and there's nothing but a ton of talk about swim baits here we've got the the best Fisherman, you know, we got the Bass Master Classic champion, and you guys are talking about swim baits. And uh, I got to thinking about, you know, he's absolutely right. But, you know, the funny thing about these live streams is that there are two things that go on on every live stream I've noticed. You have guys who make comments that are related to the show, and then you always have another group of people who literally are having their own conversation on these live streams that look, they may or may not have anything to do with, uh, with the show. And what do you, do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing? So, so I don't put those, I didn't, since I'm in charge of the comments tonight, 
I don't put those. I didn't put any of those comments online uh, on the thing for what's his name to see. You and I see them, and everyone else sees them. Yeah, yeah, right, right. I understand if you know if people can do multitask and do both at the at do that at the same time to to each his own. You don't have to read the comments uh, yeah. if there's something that I feel like is pertinent or I've been. To be honest, I was trying to put as much stuff on as I thought would work tonight. Yeah. Uh, because I, you know. I was I was hoping that uh, I was hoping to ask the questions that people wanted. I think you and I have talked about it uh, in our private conversations that we yeah. we want to be we want to try to have those questions that people ask get answered. Uh, yeah. But at the same time, it, sometimes it can be sometimes it can be a little overwhelming to be honest. Yeah, it, it can be. Uh, there'll be times when the comments are going so fast you can't keep track of them. But yeah. I don't really, I don't really have a problem with either. I, I totally agree with Tom's comment. I think if you got the Bassmaster Champ on, you probably ought to focus on that. But at the same time, I'm guilty of this as well. I'll get on other live streams, and I'll be chatting with the guys about different stuff, you know. And that's kind of a fun, that's kind of a fun thing about the whole process. So, I, uh, I, I I'm kind of good either way to tell you the truth. Yeah, I don't. I don't really. Uh, I think it. Sometimes it's 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 overwhelming to to see all the stuff as as good as it is. I think though you do have to be respectful, as Frank just said. You do have to be respectful to everybody in here. I think if you get a little nasty to somebody, yeah, don't take it personal. I, I, I will. I have no problem. I will. I don't want to block anybody. Having said that. I've only blocked two people, and I blocked somebody this week who just got overly, um, who just got overly intense about my video on Monster Bass, and he couldn't. He kept saying, "Well, Monster Bass doesn't do this," and I kept going, "Well, it says it right on their website," and he kept going, "No, it doesn't," and I'm like, "You know, here's a screenshot, idiot," and. <laughs> And it just got, it kept getting worse and worse and worse. And then finally, I finally went, you want to know what uh, B nuts or whatever his name is? I, I, I don't like the way this is going. And, and, you know, you're, you're calling me, he's at one point he called me un-American and that made no <laughs> sense at all. Uh, you know, you know, oh, Rick dude. says that he only uses, Rick goes on a thing saying, well, I try to put as many, uh, American made baits in the box as possible. Uh, six out of the eight were from China this month. So don't <laughs> tell me that and, and stop believing that Rick is a god uh, because you're just being fed from a car salesman and that ain't cool. So at, at that point in time, I finally said, you know what, dude, be nuts. I'm blocking you. I, you can unsubscribe. I don't care. I don't want your ignorance and those comments affecting good people that uh, because you 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 can disagree with what I say I have no problem with that but if you're not respectful to me or respectful at all then I'm not going to put up with that and that's how I agree because I don't call anybody I, I try not to call anybody names I joke around and that kind of stuff but as you know that last video from Mo monster bass was drastically edited yeah yeah uh, yeah you were you were fired up you were definitely fired up over that and you you toned it way down and, yes uh, uh i think guys don't realize that and and uh you know in some ways what's it really matter i mean you you uh you've got an opinion and it's not a bad opinion it's and no. uh you know it it definitely I think that one thing guys ought to realize when it comes to Steve Chapman is you've got a history in the fishing industry where you've been involved in the lure making process personally uh, for years and years and years. Your perspective on this kind of stuff is very different than the average Joe. And you get, uh, you probably get a little more riled up about it than the average Joe does as well because of your you know you know all the inner workings of how this stuff works and uh you know there may be a passing comment from someone uh that most of us that would just go right by us we wouldn't even think about it but you key in on it you're like no 
uh, wait, did you see what that person said? That's not right. I, I, I absolutely know for a fact that's not right. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, so. You know, I, I don't have anything negative really to say about this monster bass. I don't want to hurt. I'm not trying to hurt their business. I'm just being, from what I know, and really, the crazy thing about that last video of Monster Bass is I had five lure manufacturers call me and say, bravo, it's about time someone said this. And three of them have been in his boxes. And, you know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not trying to, to hurt him or his business at all. At this point in time, it isn't for me because it isn't that I have such dislike for it, but I, I'm a believer if you say something to me and you're collecting my money, you should be doing what you say. And that's where I disagree with, uh, with Rick. That's it. Well, I think what Frank's fishing saying here is spot on because listen, Frank, I know Frank, Frank loves Monster Bass products. He's very happy with them. He 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 catches tons of fish with them. He's very very happy with that product. <clears throat> and he says, "Look, uh, well, it went by now." But oh, basically, sorry. <clears throat> basically, he says, uh, "You know, I've got I, I've got respect for Steve, regardless of what his opinion is. I still like Monster Bass." Here he says. I respect what you say about monster bass. Even if we don't agree, we still have respectful conversations about it and admit we are wrong, et cetera. And that's the way it should be. Uh, you know, um, we're not all going to agree on everything to think yeah. we would is just silly. Uh, but, but, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't hate monster bass. I just, a lot of their products I really like. Um, and so I'm probably not as far on the spectrum as you are, but I, you know, I've noticed a few things too, just like you've said, where, wait a minute, that's, that, that can't be right. Or that looks a little odd or, or <laughs> onto, onto, uh, six out of eight lures. Well, I mean that, you know, whether it's made in America or not really matters to some people a lot. And then some people, they don't care, you know, uh, but, Here's the sad reality. If you want, if you want that box to be as cheap as possible, they all got to come from China. Unfortunately, if, that is a hundred percent right. If you want to, if you want to spend a little extra money, then you might can get some, some, uh, American made stuff. But I mean, that's, and right now the way the economy is going, American made stuff's just going sh 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 higher, higher, yeah. higher. I'm still a big American fan. Obviously, I, I want to buy as much USA products as I possibly can. But yes, me too. It's just uh, hard to compete with what they're doing on the lure manufacturer. Now, I know their lures, the lures that are coming from overseas, are going up 15, 20 percent. I understand that. That's but here in the United States, hard baits are really tough to make here. Now, there's a few manufacturers that do soft plastics. There's a a humongous soft plastic a, a manufacturer in Jacksonville, Florida, and they do hundreds of people's soft plastics. They pour them all sorts of stuff, uh, like culprit here in um, mm -hmm. Claremont. You could I go to Claremont and I stop by the culprit thing. They're shooting the baits in the back right there. They're a hundred percent made in the United States. There's a really big difference in someone saying. Uh, made in the USA or the, or using the logo because you can say you're made in the USA if you use a certain percentage of the stuff is put in the United States. But that doesn't mean that they're not using parts from China and bringing them in and making two or three percent of the lure. So you have to know the ins and outs of what really is going on in the industry. And, and I've I, I've spent a lot of time. It isn't like I've just just showed up and have a, a an opinion. Um, there's a lot of stuff that that I've hard dealt to, with. And go ahead. Hard to compete with slave labor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're right, Tex. You were right.
and 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 have seen and done and 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 really i have no problem if i'm wrong i'm wrong that's that's perfectly fine and i i enjoy being taught by like you know booster has taught me a lot of stuff and texas huntsman's uh giving me some information that i didn't know there's a lot of people that have helped me become more educated on a lot of stuff on lures and stuff like that yeah uh but and and, and always continuing to learn is a great thing but this guy was just Every, to call someone un-American who, I mean, I'm all American. I'm 100% all American. I, tackle webs, 100% made in the United States of America. Awesome, uh, awesome. This is part of the company I own. So, Heck yeah, you know. Hey, Tom, we love having you on the channel, man. It's all good. It's all good. And, and, and let me just say, uh, Gramps is going to be out there on Monster Bass tomorrow. I wish him the best of luck. Heck yeah. Is it tomorrow? Oh, see, tomorrow's Thursday, right? Yeah. Yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, they I do that for the in here. So I'm going to be tuning into that if I get off the water in time because that, that should be good. Yeah. Uh, so what else is happening? I mean, are, are you uploading videos while you're up there just out of curiosity? No, I'm not doing squat. I am videotaping a lot of stuff. So, oh, good. You know, that'll, that'll give me stuff to, to, upload but man i don't have time to do anything but fish really and sleep yeah so but uh what do you got going on what's going on with your channel this week i uploaded a video but now that i'm here i have zero clue which one it is wow i don't know why now now you got me thinking oh hold on i'll just go to my trash real fast so I think uh, it might be, I did a closer look of, well, you want to, first off, oh, it's the River to Sea ICBM on Saturday. Intercontinental oh, Ballistic Minnow. Oh, yeah. Chase, what a... Mm -hmm. That is a turd lure, man. I did my best on this one. I'm going to make it look better than it is. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, if anybody is killing it on the icbm put in the comments because i need to know what the heck you're doing <laughs> it's funny because i i, I had you know when i started doing these closer look doing a lot of research on how to, on people are doing it. and i called them and said explain to me what i'm doing on here and uh and they said well it has four different ways of of running i'm like what <laughs> there's four different ways to use this lure explain how and then they they told me and then i went to the the spring and i'm like i can't get anything but one to work so i don't know if there's i don't know really if there was ever four but it's too funny because hey. i talk about it and i have i never could figure it out here's a strategy guys if you've got any of the icbms at home and you haven't used them yet here's a, something you can do with them open the package <laughs> take the hooks take the hooks off and use the hooks on another bait and throw the lure away <laughs> <laughs> they do have great hooks. <laughs> uh, I love river. To, I mean, there's a lot of great river. The Whopper Plopper, it's awesome. There's a lot, yeah. of, good, a lot of good river to sea products. The, um, uh, oh man, their swim bait. Why can't I not think of it? Quick, Matthew, what's the, uh, what's the river to sea swim bait called? Oh, they make a good frog, I thought. There was something froggish I thought they had. They make all kinds of good stuff, but, uh. I don't know, man. That ICBM is kind of a turd. <laughs> Frank, use it as a necklace charm. <laughs> <laughs> Have that thing bling it out. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Maybe so. Oh, uh, that's man. the S waiver. Yeah, the S waiver, dude. That is not. That I is can't get that to work. For there. the money, for the money, the S waiver may be the best swim bait on the market. Uh, because it's just not very expensive and it flat out catches fish. And if you don't believe me, go watch tactical bass and man, they've caught thousands and thousands of fish on that S waiver. Here's a, here's a, you want to, we ought to throw this out as a topic for one week that we don't have a guest best three lures under $8 That'd be under fun. $10. That'd be fun. And then worst three lures. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, let's do that. That'd be fun. That would be fun. We can't really announce next week's person, uh, 
But yeah. I'm I'm supposed to be talking to his daughter tomorrow morning. And yeah. if if we have the go ahead, we're gonna post a week early who the, the person is. Graphic. Yeah, so <clears throat> just think to yourself, who could be better than Hank Cherry? Who could be oh. bigger than Hank Cherry? <clears throat> It's possible. There's actually someone out there. I honestly believe it would be the, the biggest guest we've ever had. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think. The underwater footage when you roll your kayak in the current. Nice. <laughs> Booster wants me to roll my boat, man. Jeez. <clears throat> All good for to... footage. Just to try to get some good footage. Mr. Bass just looked at the IC ICBM. Good to keep in your car as a defensive weapon. <laughs> well, heck, that's what they – intercontinental ballistic missile, right? That's what the ICBM is. Uh, but, dude, man, I, uh, I'd i say that uh, is not going to do much to protect you. And it ain't yeah. going to catch many fish for you either. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't want to wrap it up early, but to be honest, I really have to go to the bathroom. All right, let's do it. Okay. Everyone, make sure you go. Let me put this on real fast. Everyone, go to both channels. Why didn't that show up? There it is. Go to both channels. Thumb, Give it a thumbs up. Subscribe. Hit that click notification bell. Leave a comment. Do all of it. Please. Um, right and I wish you the best of luck over the next couple days. I normally take us out, but why don't you take us out this week? All right, uh, take a kid fishing, get your fish on, and pray that I catch some fish up here uh, on Saturday. I could use all the help I can get. See You're you guys. Kill Have a good one. Yes.